All right, obviously, I have to start today's Young Heretics episode by talking about a major case of controversy, a suspected fraud involving a well-known English public figure. And if you can believe it, I'm actually not talking about Kate Middleton, Princess of Wales. Okay, I actually really need help here. G Gondor calls for aid. If some person, some listener out there can write in and tell me a hot take that I'm supposed to have, something I'm supposed to think about, whatever's going on right now with Kate Middleton, I would really appreciate it because I do not follow the royals at all. Suddenly she's on every social media feed. She's, I guess the like royals seem to have put out a fake photo of her, a, a photoshopped picture after she went in for surgery. Nobody quite knows where she is, and everybody's doing the whole corkboard and string thing where they're trying to figure out where she's really at and what's really going on. So if somebody has some conspiracy theory or some hot take that they just want to foist upon me, now's your chance, right in. Uh, my ears are open. I'm, I'm ready because I have absolutely no idea what's going on there. And that is not, in fact, the suspected case of English fraud that I will be talking about today. Instead, I'll be talking about a much older English public figure in The Wizard Merlin. And we started off with this last week. We've been on this whole magic kick, which I've been really enjoying on the show. I've been especially enjoying all of the thoughts that it seems to have generated in you guys, because you've been writing in and telling me some things that you've been thinking about. This whole idea that science and magic are kind of these parallel tracks. They're these parallel projects. And in fact, the development of successful science is often represented as the arrival of real magic, where the old magic was just fake. And one thing I suggested last week is that that's really a process that's always ongoing, and so you're always getting these claims that the magic of yesteryear, the magicians of the past period are frauds and they're really just playing tricks on you. But now there's new magic that actually works, actually makes sense, and does discover what Francis Bacon called the hidden causes of things and produces wondrous effects. And so I, I cited one example of this, which was from the earliest history of Merlin himself, who seems to emerge in the chronicles of Geoffrey of Monmouth. And the first thing he does is he solves an engineering problem, which other sorcerers can't solve. So much like like the Magi in the court of Nebuchadnezzar in the book of Daniel, who can't interpret the dream rightly. Merlin has deeper underlying knowledge of what's causing, in this case, the foundation of a tower not to stand. And that underlying knowledge is exactly the kind of knowledge that science seeks. And so now what I want to do is talk about how that kind of medieval beginning to the idea of, of magic starts to then get undermined again by modern science and the Industrial Revolution, which will come along and claim that Merlin, who was once the real magician that displaced the fake magicians, now Merlin is going to become the fake magician to be displaced by modern science and by the Industrial Revolution. And so to get into this, I'm actually going to start with the mailbag question. I'm going to break with Young Heretic's tradition just a little bit and start out with a question that somebody wrote in to ask me because I thought it was so remarkable how exactly this dovetails with what I want to talk about today. So this is from Stephen, and, and anytime you want to write in with a question, all you got to do is subscribe to my Substack, which is rejoiceevermore.substack.com. You can email me that way. You can DM me. You will get a weekly newsletter that I write. You can also support me financially if that's something you're interested in. I really have become a big Substack enthusiast. That's where I do a lot of my work now. And if you're interested in following me, if you like my stuff, that's kind of a big clearinghouse for all of it. I also have a Substack with my dad, The New Jerusalem, which I'll link to in this show description as well. But that's the way that you can get in touch and write in with listener questions. And here's Stephen, who writes, In That Hideous Strength, which is a novel by C.S. Lewis, there's a scene where he gives some explanation of magic and Merlin that I don't understand. As best I can summarize, the character Ransom is explaining that there is a law of history, that things increasingly become more distinct, 
Specifically, there was a time where magic was neither necessarily good nor bad, notably during the Middle Ages, so that's the period we've been talking about. But as time drew on, good and bad made themselves more distinct, such that now, in 1940s England, there is no good magic. Thus, Merlin was an important player for defeating the NICE, which is the villains in the book, because he was from a time before the separation where there could be such a thing as good use of magic. Now, on one level, of course, this is something, these are all ideas that I've been talking about on the show, but I don't think necessarily I've yet mentioned that this is exactly where I want to go with this whole Merlin thing. I want to compare two modern depictions of Merlin in the age of science. So the medieval magician, the guy who was the cutting edge, up-to-date scientist, magician, knower of hidden causes in the medieval world. I want to compare two different depictions of him from the world where science has, kind of modern science, has displaced that older idea. And one of them is Mark Twain's Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, but the other one is Merlin in That Hideous Strength. And Stephen is asking, you know, it's all a little confusing. Is this something that maybe a reference to Tolkien, because Middle Earth is a big part of the Space Trilogy, which is what C.S. Lewis is writing about, but also, you know, Lewis was a big expert in the Middle Ages, so he, he must have known what he was up to, but Stevens just doesn't feel like it kind of comes together for him. And I have a lot to say about this, maybe more than just one hour's worth. I, the, the, there's, like, something really profound that Lewis is doing with Merlin, and to get there, to explain it, I have to go back and talk to you about uh, Mark Twain and how Merlin appears in the industrial era. You, you guys, I'm not superstitious, but I do believe in the supernatural, which is quite a different thing that I'll get into in a second. And I'm noticing that I'm often now getting messages from you about something that I'm right on the cusp of thinking about or talking about. And I always say that God prepares my reading lists, like that the ideas you need come at you at exactly the right time. And these letters feel like that too. They feel like part of a larger sort of pattern that we're engaged in or a set of ideas that are sort of in the air. And that might sound kooky to you, which I would understand, but I just want to defend for a second the idea that actually this thread of thought is really important and it's not just us that are kind of thinking about it, but that it's kind of operative working in, in the air right now. I, I said that I'm not superstitious, but I believe in the supernatural. Let me, let me say a little bit about the difference between those two things. To be superstitious is to think that you have some kind of access to patterns that can teach you how to make the world go your way, which is kind of what science claims to do for real, but in superstition you, you have this on the basis of sort of folk tales or ideas that are maybe hazy and unconfirmed. Like, you know, if you walk under a ladder, something bad's going to happen to you. If you put your shoes on the table. And I think that those are just false attempts to control the world, which presents us with all sorts of uncertainties and, and, and with chaos. And so I'm not superstitious, and I try very hard not to be superstitious, because I, I, don't, I think that's, in some sense, a kind of false religion, like God is in charge of things. But because I believe God is in charge of things, I do believe in a logic that overarches the logic of the natural world. And that's what supernatural means. We think of supernatural as like, ooh, spooky. It's the same as superstition, or it's like ghosts, and it's whatever. But it's in its Latin origins, it just means that there is something which is super, above, natura, which is the whole cause and effect system within which we find ourselves and make our observations and explore and do science and, and all of that stuff. And the long-standing philosophical idea until very recently was that in order to believe in the logic of nature, in order to believe that nature has a rational order that you can observe and discern and do science with and predict things about, you have to believe that there is a logic above nature that gives the whole thing coherence and shape. Because in our day-to-day -day lives and observations, we see some patterns, but we actually don't see a 
coherent system of things. We see many things that don't fit into our current model. And those are the sorts of things that trigger us to ask scientific questions, like why do planets revolve around the, the sun? Why do apples fall to the ground? Because they don't actually fit with the behavior of other things that we currently observe. And we're trying to bring them into a bigger structure that makes sense of things, right? And if you didn't believe that that structure was out there, that there is a larger order that governs the whole thing, then you would have no reason to expect an answer to your questions. You would have no reason to think that apples fall to the ground for a reason and to go and ask these sorts of scientific questions. So nature, the idea of nature as a logically ordered whole, implies, necessitates supernature, or if you like the Greek word better, metaphysics, which is just the same root, right? It's meta plus physis, something that is beyond or above nature, supernatural, metaphysical. In their philosophical sense, these words mean the same thing. And in order for us to do science, we have to believe that the world that we see and touch, the observations that we can make, even when they seem chaotic and disordered, come as like waves on the shore of a vast ocean. And that ocean is part of this big, complicated, varied pattern. And the patterns we observe are sort of offshoots or final results of this big subterranean set of causes. And this, by the way, does have to do with Merlin and, and will have a point to it in the rest of the episode as well. But I just want to dwell on it when I say that I think, you know, I'm getting these emails at this time for a specific reason that I don't know that there's like a bigger order going on here. I want to defend that as a rational position and not just superstition. And what's really important to understand is that science itself often frequently works this way, that you will have a system of mathematical laws that is good for predicting and giving coherence and order to the current set of observations that we're capable of making. Newton's laws are a classic example. In fact, they are the laws that found, that found classical physics because they bring order in a new way that hadn't yet been done to all observations that were capable of being made at the time, observations of the planets that had been going on for millennia since, you know, the really the dawn of human reason. People had been watching the stars and the sky, but also observations about apples falling from trees and things that happened closer to home. And for a long time, it was thought that those were different systems, that they had different logic because they didn't seem to cohere. But in the faith that there is a larger order that brings them all together, Newton found this clean set of rules that describes them all and and bound the whole universe together, but not actually the whole universe, because then as our observations began to expand and we were capable of making larger observations and measuring things at more precisely, especially and importantly, the, the speed of light and the behavior of electromagnetism, you start to get new anomalies, things that don't fit that pattern. And one response to that would simply be to say, well, Newton's laws have failed. But that's only if you think that Newton's laws are supposed to describe everything. But they're actually not. They're supposed to describe the remit of our experience at the time. And now we're broadening our experience out and we're finding that there are limits to, to those laws, limits to that description. And so Einstein's theory of relativity, which basically takes physics down to the studs and establishes certain basic principles that are quite different from those in Newton, like that the speed of light is absolute from every frame of reference, is on one level, it's like a totally new or even contradictory pattern. But on another level, if you think of it as kind of zooming out and out, it's just another layer of this larger pattern that is is more varied. And that process continues forever because our experience of things, which is sensory and physical, actually always arises. It's like the sort of thread that comes up in needlepoint and arises out of a deeper well of order and logic that is metaphysical, that gives rise to the physical world. And so I will predict to you, I rarely make predictions, but I will predict with confidence that we're always going to go on doing this. There is no unified field theory of everything because the universe, as we expand our experience of it, behaves according to laws that generate certain different results in different contexts and at different 
outreaches. And we're dealing with one of these crises in science right now. In fact, we have been for a while because when quantum physics emerged, one of the things that it came out of was a realization that these deterministic laws, which give you an absolute answer for where a particle is going to go on the basis of our current information about it, can't account for certain other observed realities, especially the second law of thermodynamics, which is the sort of chaos that emerges when you start to let gases and gaseous particles open in a, in a room, that things tr tend toward entropy. And as people start to study this in greater and greater detail, they realize that the best description of it might actually be that there's a little bit of randomness in, like, the minutest collision of particle with particle, so that you don't actually get to say, I know definitely what angle this particle is going to bounce off, but that I have a high degree of confidence that 99% of the time or something, it's going to go this way. And so these rules that look to determinist at the macro level turn out at the micro level to have a degree of randomness in it. And that same kind of logic, when it's transmuted, when it's transposed into the field of electrodynamics and how light and radiation behaves, that be starts to become quantum physics, this idea that like, actually, there's all sorts of indeterminacy baked into existence at the level that we cannot observe, which is exactly where would, you would expect it to enter. Because at that point, our observation has yet to make the world into the sort of thing that human beings observe. And this is like a larger set of topics. But Right now, what we're up against might be actually the foundational fact that in the physical world, determinism isn't the full story, isn't the final answer, these clean sets of rules. And, and you can study right now the attempts that are being made to reconcile Einstein's determinist rules, which are very much, he was very committed to the idea that, as he said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. We should know in a system, if we know the right information, we should be able to predict how it's going to act absolutely. And so gravity in, in Einstein's theory of relativity has that logic. But then it clashes, it butts heads with these quantum discoveries that are extending our observation into new spheres. And this is one of the central problems in physics is how do you find an overarching larger logic that reconciles them both? And I just wanted to read to you, you know, I, I, I promise, I, this is interesting in and of itself, but I promise this tangent has, has a point and, and is, has a reason for existing in this episode about Merlin. I just wanted to read to you a, a passage from an essay. There's been some really interesting stuff done in this field lately by a guy called Oppenheim, of all people, which is really funny because Oppenheimer is the big blockbuster scientist that made the atom bomb that we're all learning about right now. And there are some good articles in Nautilus, which is kind of a popular science website by this woman, uh, Sabina Hossenfelder, who's a critic of Oppenheim, but is very generous in explaining kind of what his idea is, which is basically that you can modify the, the theory of gravity so that it is itself random at the micro level. She says, Oppenheim's new approach overcomes this problem by leaving gravity a non-quantum theory, but giving it a random element. This randomness of post-quantum gravity doesn't come from anything else. It's a fundamental ingredient, the starting point. Now, this is still very, very fresh and speculative, and it, it might or might not help to eliminate some of the problems with dark matter, and all of that's very exciting. But my reason for raising it is just to say, scientists right now are butting heads with the idea that there might be a limit to how much order our observations can impose on a world beyond what we can observe, which would mean effectively that in the supernatural there is an order that our physical observations will never ultimately have access to, that nature is bounded by supernature in some sense. And there's randomness going on from our perspective that might only be non-random, that might only have order from a more than physical perspective, which is a very long way of saying that it's not irrational to propose that that order, if it, if it is the place where the cosmic mind operates, and there are good reasons to think that that is where the cosmic mind operates, is the order that looks to us like randomness. And so when we get 
randomness or we say, oh, that's so random that this just happened at the right moment. But then often we notice these coincidences and we're like, oh, I sort of see that you sent me this email at exactly this moment. You know, there's many, many, many steps between the fluctuations of gravity at the level where quantum physics operates and and that experience, like gajillions of steps. But the principle, I think, holds good that if there's an order which is not accessible through physical material observation, but nevertheless causes all physical material observations to express a certain pattern, a varied pattern, then we can actually say that things that look random to us aren't necessarily totally random and might be products of intention. That's all I have to say about that for now, although I think it's a fascinating subject in and of itself. It will come back in just a second when we get to talking about Merlin. But first, in April, many things will happen. The spring will begin in earnest. The uh, My book will be one month fewer uh, away. But most importantly, the registration for the Ancient Language Institute's summer term will close next month, April 13th. It's going to happen. And so you do not want to miss out on this. you got to go to ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics and sign up for one of their courses. I promise you won't regret it. Do yourself a favor this summer and learn Latin, Greek, Biblical Hebrew, Anglo-Saxon, any one of these languages will enrich your life immeasurably. If you already know one, you can improve. They will meet you at the beginner or the intermediate level or wherever, and they teach in this really intuitive way that makes it just fun and easy to get started reading. Reading things like the Bible in its original languages, or Virgil, or the Beowulf. I mean, just the the greats of the canon. You can have access to them unmediated by translation. I won't say with no effort because it will be a, a challenge, but it will be the most rewarding thing, one of the most rewarding things that you do intellectually in your life if you take me up on this. I guarantee it. Ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics and the deepest secret, the magic word that you can only learn by listening right now, right here to this show is that if you enter my name, S-P-E-N-C-E-R, as a promo code at checkout, then you will get 10% off your registration fee. So one more time, ancientlanguage.com slash youngheretics. Sign up before their registration closes and learn a little Latin this summer. Why not, right? Okay, so how do we tie all of this together? I've been saying that random things aren't necessarily random. I've been saying that the order which we observe in the universe is only one fringe of a grander and more intricate pattern that every time we stretch our awareness out to the fringes, we suddenly see anomalies and incorporating those anomalies into our theory makes our theory more complex, but it also shows us a larger part of this tapestry. And at the same time, I've been suggesting that there are parts of the tapestry that are always behind, right? That are that are not part of the visible threads that we see, but are rather underneath our anything that we can physically observe. And that order that get, looks random to us might finally be inaccessible in some profound way. Magic and science, or the sort of magic science project that we've been talking about for weeks now is just the effort to uncover more of those threads and to draw inferences about how the weave fits together. And every time you get a new crisis point where what has originally looked like a comprehensive theory of all observations starts to be like broken down or challenged by other observations, that's when science makes its radical advances. And that is also when you start to hear talk about fake magicians and shysters and fools posing as magical people. And that's not an accident. So you get it in this transition from medieval science to, to modern science, and you get it also in the transition from sort of pre-medieval superstition into the medieval thought of, of how the world works. So we saw one already when Merlin himself emerges as this new magician that can understand things like engineering and, and so forth. Now we're going to get another one in the form of the dominance of, of modern science and the triumph, so-called, of modern science over medieval sensibilities. And a really good way to get 
a handle on this, to get an understanding of it, is to take a look at this 19th century book by Mark Twain called A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. So we're thinking now about how when modern science comes along, the medieval magicians that once looked like the the true and real magicians start to look like the fake posers and the, the fake magicians. And that's what this book is kind of all about. It's about a guy, uh, Hank Morgan, who's an engineer and kind of like a MacGyver type. He says that he's able to make like basically anything out of anything and he can contrive to recreate modern technology using very few tools. And that just happens to be extremely convenient for Twain because when he's bonked on the head by in, in a fight, in a brawl, Hank Morgan wakes up in the 6th century in King Arthur's court in the somewhere early in the 500s. I forget, some 520s somewhere he puts him. And he has to figure out how to survive, how to get by. He has to, he goes on a series of picaresque adventures. It's all very fun. But the way that he ends up rising to the top of not even medieval, but pre-medieval society is by using modern science to look like a real magician that can do what all these fake magicians claim to do. And this is a perfect example, avant la lettre, which is a fancy French phrase meaning that Twain anticipated, got in ahead of Arthur C. Clarke, who said sort of famously that the sufficiently advanced science would be indistinguishable from magic. Because if somebody came to us now from a million years in the future and they had some technology that, I don't know, could, you know, uh, make use of the strong force or could um, uh, manipulate the uh, many dimensions that sort of exist and are supposed to exist in string theory or whatever— we who have not yet cracked that, that code would only see the effects of it. We wouldn't see what Bacon called the wondrous causes. We would only see the wondrous, or the hidden causes rather. We would only see the wondrous effects and we would think this person was able basically to do magic. There's a Marge Simpson quote from one of these these Simpsons episodes in the future, when it jumps forward into the future, that they, they do something like they take a picture and the picture turns into a cake with the picture on it and Marge says, we can do anything now that scientists have invented magic. And that's the idea, right? That's that's what Hank Morgan looks like to these Arthurian knights. And Twain, I have to say, you know, disclaimer here, I, I love Mark Twain. Huckleberry Finn is in the running for me for the great American novel. He's a brilliant stylist, a, a wry character, and, and always playing a bit of a role, adopting a bit of a persona. So I don't know how sincere he is in some of these statements in the book, but Twain is, is in, in a funny way, useful here for his flaws because he presents himself at least as this earnest and totally naive true believer in the industrial revolution as a dawn of a totally new era in in human life that makes basically everything before it at least in terms of technology obsolete and hopefully if you've been listening to me for any amount of time at all you know that that is not the right picture that the real picture is one of gradual sort of expansion of of human awareness often or almost always under the aegis of this larger logic that there is a god who gives order to the universe and it's only recently that we've adopted this very arrogant idea that at some point we somehow discovered that like we don't need any of that we do still need all of this stuff and that's why i'm digging back into the into deep time but here's what twain says at, at the opening about his depiction of the sixth century. He says, look, I've depicted lots of barbarous customs. The, and he says, the ungentle laws and customs touched upon in this tale are historical, and the episodes which are used to illustrate them are also historical, but it is not pretended that these laws and customs existed in England in the 6th century. No, it is only pretended that inasmuch as they existed in the English and other civilizations of far later times, it is safe to consider that it, it is no libel upon the 6th century to suppose them to have been in practice in that day also. Now, <laughs> again, I hope that if you've listened to this show, you know that this is just flatly wrong. There are plenty. This is, this is an idea that is based on a kind of linear notion of human progress that 
before times is when they did the bad stuff and like the torture and the starvation. And now times is when we have the magic stuff and we've got like all the machines that, that make life better and also like progress and justice, right? And, and, the, and the good ideas. Um, there are plenty of examples throughout history of things getting worse and more barbarous as time moves on rather than less. You could look at the fall of the Roman Empire. You could look at the rise of the Soviet Union. There is such a thing as regress in terms of both material comfort and ideological justice. And so Twain is like, well, if it was bad in the medieval period, and uh, I can cite these bad examples, then it must have been even worse in the Arthurian period. I, I'm sure it was no picnic, by the way, to live in, <laughs> in 6th century England. I'm not saying that. But you get a flavor here for Twain's attitude, which is why I think he's able to write Merlin off as a crank and a fraud entirely, rather than doing what we've been doing, which is sort of showing how gradually each new development replaces the old and starts to accuse the other. I mean, he, he, he doesn't seem to be aware Twain here that he's actually doing exactly what Mallory does with Merlin. Um, or rather, what, what Monmouth does with, with Merlin. He, Twain uses Sir Thomas Mallory, who is a later chronicler from the 1400s. But he's basically doing exactly what, what Monmouth did last week that we read, where Merlin comes along and he's the great new wizard. Except in this case, it's Hank Morgan, avatar of industrial America, who turns out to be the next great wizard. And he proves this, basically, by inventing or reinventing machines from 19th century America that do the things that Merlin would have hoped to be able to do, like speak, cast the human voice across many, you know, miles via the telephone and, and all of that stuff. And so I wanted to read, first of all, just a passage from the, uh, from a, a moment when Morgan comes across a monastery using a, a telephone and they, it's very funny I mean, it's classic twain that um, back in the gloom of the cavern i heard the clink of a little bell and then this exclamation hello central is this you camelot behold thou mayst glad thy heart and thou hast faith to believe the wonderful when that it cometh in unexpected guise and maketh itself manifest in impossible places here standeth in the flesh his mightiness the boss and with thine own ears shall ye hear him speak so it's very funny, this juxtaposition. It's supposed to be kind of incongruous, right, that you've got this boss from the, uh, from the 19th century and you've got this 19th century technology with this old-timey-sounding talk. But that's the whole joke, right? The whole joke is, well, in, in, in before times they were savages and in now times they have real magic. And so here's like the coming of, of light and, and knowledge to a time when all magic was basically fake. Here's the next paragraph speak, spoken in the voice of Morgan. Now what a radical reversal of things this was. What a jumbling together of extravagant incongruities. What a fantastic conjunction of opposites and irreconcilables. The home of the bogus miracle become the home of a real one. The den of a medieval hermit turned into a telephone office. So there's the idea in a nutshell, right? That Merlin was always just, uh, was, was just full of it, was just playing tricks. And now we've got the real engineer. But of course, we know, you and I, from listening to Young Heritage, that Merlin was an engineer, right? That's what Geoffrey of Monmouth sort of showed us, is that the idea of magic was already this idea of uncovering hidden causes. It's just that now we've learned to do it even better because of Newton and because of the Industrial Revolution and, and all of this stuff. And so when Morgan and Merlin come into conflict, they're represented as kind of polar opposites, but they're actually the same person. That's what's so amazing about this book, both as an entertainment, but also as sort of a flawed product of 19th century optimism about technology and about machines, that 
Twain doesn't realize that Morgan basically is Merlin. He's the new version of what Merlin was to the medievals who invented him. And so here's what, at one point, he's in, he's in prison and he's trying to engineer a way out. And he hears about this, this Merlin who makes claim to being a, a, a magician. But he knows that he can outdo this magician because he has real, so-called so real scientific knowledge. And so here's what he says. He says, the Merlin has died and come alive again 13 times and traveled under a new name every time. Smith, Jones, Robinson, Jackson, Peters, Haskins, Merlin, a new alias every time he turns up. I knew him in Egypt 300 years ago. I knew him in India 500 years ago. He is always blethering around in my way. Everywhere he go, he makes me tired. He don't amount to shucks as a magician. He knows some of the old common tricks, but he never got beyond the rudiments and never will. So the mention of Egypt, of course, is intentional. Egypt once thought of as the repository of ancient wisdom, now represented as a sort of den of superstition and vipers and fake magicians. But in fact, of course, again, Morgan is in a tradition that goes directly back to Egypt through Merlin. And so what we have here is kind of a weird historical forgetfulness that makes it impossible for us to notice that Morgan's abilities, which are technological but also sort of theoretical and scientific because he's able, for example, to know when the, an eclipse is going to happen. And so he uses this as a stand-in for prophecy. And Twain sort of seems to think that knowing when an eclipse is going to happen is totally different from prophesying the coming of an eclipse. But in fact, one of the first things that Merlin does in Geoffrey of Monmouth's chronicle is he solves the engineering problem, and then he performs a prophecy because acts of prophecy and prediction from the Magi in Nebuchadnezzar's court up to now have always been about being able to discern patterns and attributing cause and effect to those patterns and successfully or unsuccessfully predicting the future on the basis of the observation of prior events. And that's what Morgan also is able to do. So because Twain was a genius and because even his sort of local prejudices and provincialism and chronological provincialism is really what it is, though that couldn't get in the way of his insight. He has the awareness, the knowledge to align, to, to set Morgan and Merlin up against each other in some profound way. But what he doesn't realize is that the contrast is a, con is a competition between the older model and the newer model. It's not a replacement of something totally different with something totally new. This, I think, this book might be one of the clearest illustrations of what I've been trying to get across this whole time, which is that magic and science represent the same kind of project, which is the attempt to get underneath observations into these logics that can predict future observations and future experiences, and then control by way of language or by way of technology and, and sort of intervention into cause and effect, control what's going to happen in the future. And Twain does a brilliant and hilarious and light-footed job of kind of getting that across. I think he's uh, overconfident about just how different the t titans of industry are from the medieval sorcerers. But all that having been said, no shade to Twain. I mean, he is a, a, a master and this book is well worth reading. I just thought that was really interesting and it's especially interesting. And now I am going to answer Stephen's question or try to. It's especially interesting when you contrast it to what Lewis is doing in That Hideous Strength. So let me set the scene here a little bit. This is a 1945 novel, so later than Twain, and maybe that has something to do with the fact that Lewis is more jaundiced about what technological attitudes, techno technological development, and the sort of pro-tech mindset. Lewis has a lot more skepticism about that than, than I think Twain does. And Twain indulges in a lot of, you know, excitement about the age of reason and the French Revolution and all of that, whereas Lewis has lived through industrial warfare and he's seen the chasm in the heart of man and he's realized that actually all of this talk of reason and this resort to grand 
ideals or abstract principles isn't going to save us, isn't going to cleanse the heart of man. And, and that has created in him a, a deep-seated anxiety about where all of this technology will lead us if it doesn't come with a supernatural order. If all we have is the order of nature and our attempts to manipulate nature, Lewis wrote very profoundly in The Abolition of Man about how that will turn into a hellish war of all against all because you no longer have this, what he called the Tao or the moral law or the intangible order that gives shape to the observations we experience in the physical and natural world. And unless you have that metaphysical sense that the what we experience as random is actually arising out of a deeper pattern of order, unless you have that, science just becomes about strength and the imposition of the will on basically your victims or your patients or whatever you want to call them. And so that is what that hideous strength is about. It is one of the great novels of the 20th century. It's technically the third in a trilogy. And if you really want to get into Lewis's thought on this and really immerse yourself in what he has to say here, then you should start with Out of the Silent Planet, which is the first book, and then Paralandra, which is the second. And the first one, he goes to his hero goes to Mars. Second one, he goes to Venus. And there's a lot in there about you know, the medieval idea of the spheres, and there's some Dionysius the Areopagite, whom we read last week. There's a ton of stuff that kind of makes its way very lightly but visibly into this grand, you know, rollicking sci-fi adventure. All of that well worth reading. But I say that as preface to also stating my heretical opinion that you can just read that hideous strength on its own, and it's far and away the best of the three. I mean, the other two are good and interesting and fun. This one is great. This one is enduring and I think will stand out as as one of Lewis's great contributions. I think it's the whole thing is way, way better than Narnia, but that's really like, don't at me. I, I'm a total curmudgeon when it comes to Narnia. But I, I think that, you know, that his strength really is kind of his, his masterwork in terms of fiction. And it's about this technological attitude, this scientistic attitude unmoored from the metaphysical idea of of the good or of some more than merely physical thing. It's about nature unmoored from supernature and, and what man becomes, which is why the title is a reference to a poem about the Tower of Babel, because the Tower of Babel for Lewis and many others before him represents that project of sheer human imposition. We shall make a name for ourselves. We shall impose our will upon the raw material of nature to bring order entirely under our control. All shall speak one language. All shall serve one king. It's part of an imperial project. And that, for Lewis, is exactly the same thing that happens when you become addicted to technology and the manipulation of matter as an end unto itself. That, for Lewis, is the definition of dark magic and also of bad science because they are the same thing. And so he tells this story about the rise of an institute brilliantly called NICE, the N-I-C-E, um, the Institute for Coordinated, the National Institute for Coordinated Experiments, I guess is, is how that acronym cashes out. And I won't spoil too many plot points, but basically Lewis has a hero, a, an unlikely bumbling hero, and a heroine who's somewhat more kind of uh, rooted, at, at least, and, and doesn't fall prey to, to night, the nice in the way that Mark, her husband, does. But Jane Studdock, the uh, wife of the couple, ends up with Ransom, who is this voyager from beyond the stars, who comes back with all this knowledge of heaven. And the reason Stephen is asking me about this novel is because it turns out in the end that in order to defeat Nice, which is this vast world-encompassing Tower of Babel project of turning everything into human order and physical order and, and mathematical rules, in order to defeat them, they, uh, they have to excavate, they have to dig up Merlin. And it starts out with the NIC itself trying to dig up Merlin because for them, Merlin represents the old way of magic that they are now trying to modernize and bring into the, the modern world. But 
when they finally get him, when he when he comes up out of the ground, it turns out that actually he's more on the side of the rebels, who are this ragtag team of literary scholars. One of them is an Arthurian expert, and of course Ransom, who's the, a Christian that has traveled to the stars. And in, in in reality, Merlin, after he kind of gets his bearings and starts to realize where he's at, wants to rebel against the modern scientific project. And so Stephen is saying, what what is going on here? And, and so there are a few passages I want to read in order to kind of illustrate this different idea that Lewis has about the continuity of magic and the possibility of bringing the best of the old magic forward rather than just, you know, shrugging off the old magic as, as cheap tricks and resorting instead to what will become an anti-human and, and unhuman project. So Here's a, an interaction between Merlin and, and Ransom, who in this novel is called the director, where Merlin says, you know, I can give you a drug to cure this um, injury that you got in the last book. And, and, and Merlin says, through me, you can suck up from the earth oblivion of all pains. So he's referring to some herbal medicinal knowledge he must have. Silence, said the director sharply. He had been sinking down into the cushions of his sofa with his head and drooping a little towards his chest. Now he suddenly sat bolt upright. The magician started and straightened himself likewise. The air of the room was cleared. Even the bear opened its eyes again. There's, this, there's a bear character in this, in this novel. No, said the director. God's glory, do you think you were dug out of the earth to give me a plaster for my heel? We have drugs that could cheat the pain as well as your earth magic, or better, if it were not my business to bear it till the end. I will hear no more of that. Do you understand? I hear and I obey, said the magician, but I meant no harm, if not to heal your own wound, yet for the healing of Logris, you will need my commerce with field and water. It must be that I should go in and out and to and fro, renewing old acquaintance. It will not be changed, you know, not what you would call changed. Now, the um, the reference to Logris here, there's a conflict for Lewis between the old kind of pagan spirit of England and the Christian spirit of Arthurian England. And so that's what, you know, the, the sort of restoration of uh, a Christianized paganism, right? Like that not that paganism, we've talked about this before, not that paganism would be cast out, but that it, its forces would be brought under the heel of a supernatural order that, that is Christian. And here's what the director says. That, that is the old form of magic, cannot be done any longer. The soul has gone out of the wood and water. Oh, I dare say you could awake them a little, but it would not be enough. I forbid you to speak of it. It would be unlawful. Whatever of spirit may still linger in the earth has withdrawn 1,500 years further away from us since your time. You shall not speak a word to it. You shall not lift your little finger to call it up. I command you. It is in this age utterly unlawful. Hitherto he had been speaking sternly and coldly. Now he leaned forward and said in a different voice, It never was very lawful, even in your day. Remember, when we first knew that you would be awaked, we thought you would be on the side of the enemy. And because our Lord does all things for each, one of the purposes of your reawakening was that your own soul should be saved. So what's going on here is that Merlin... As, as Stephen mentioned, is being represented as a kind of morally ambivalent figure. He, at the time that he was operating, he was simply information gathering about the spirits in the world, which is this kind of way of describing the animate nature of how cause and effect works, that the whole world is kind of operates according to this natural order. And the ancient way of describing that is through the names of gods, right? That there's a spirit in the water, or there's a spirit in, in the air. And to speak or converse with the spirits at that point is both to engage in pagan mysticism, pagan religion, and to make scientific progress. Because the same people who believed, for example, that you know Jupiter was the god of, of the planet that they saw moving across the heavens, those same people also made some of the most precise measurements to date of how Jupiter moved. And the reason was the same, because they thought that there was a, a mind at work in the motion of the planet that they observed. They were right about that, 
But the, they hadn't yet been posed the question, where does the mind ultimately operate? And, and when they po were posed that question, then it became unlawful to talk about Jupiter as if he were a free agent, as if he were some kind of ruler in his own right, rather than one of the outworkings, the outpourings of the uh, great mind that, that governs all things. And so this is what all of this talk is about, of like things getting more and more precise and specific, is that as we learn more, once you know something, you can't then just go back and unlearn it, which is why it's worse now when we do things like astrology, because we know better. It's worse when we go away, slide away from our sort of roots in the Christian faith and in the you know founding of this country and all that. It's worse when you slide away because you already have been taught differently. And so Merlin now has to learn to do what he was trying to do, which is serve a Christian king, while using the, the good part, the good thread of the logic that he had discovered, which was this underlying order to the observations in, in the world. And so Merlin is going to become kind of the anti-nice by shaving away the parts of his project that are the same as, as nice. And to do that, he has to submit his magic to the higher supernatural order that governs the natural world. And, and the, there is then a conversation between the Dimbles, who are this, um, this kind of older couple, and, and Mr. Dimble has this whole uh, theory about how the whole, thing's wor whole thing works. And so let me just read to you a, a little bit of that conversation. He says, there used to be, this is Mr. Dimble says, there used to be things on this earth pursuing their own business, so to speak. They weren't ministering spirits sent to help fallen humanity, but neither were they enemies preying upon us. Even in St. Paul, one gets glimpses of a population that wouldn't, wouldn't exactly fit into our two columns of angels and devils. And if you go back further, all the gods, elves, dwarves, water people, fate, longaiwi, you and I know too much to think they are just illusions. And his wife says, you think there are things like that? He says, I think there were. I think there was room for them, but the universe has come more to a point. Not all rational things, perhaps. Some would be mere wills inherent in matter, hardly conscious, more like animals. Others, but I don't really know. At any rate, this is the sort of situation in which one got a man like Merlin. It all sounds rather horrible to me. It was rather horrible. I mean, even in Merlin's time, he came at the extreme tail end of it. See, Lewis has read his Monmouth, and he knows that L Merlin represented an advance away from an older form of magic, right? Though you could still use that sort of life in the universe innocently, you couldn't do it safely. The things weren't bad in themselves, but they were already bad for us. They sort of withered the man who dealt with them. Not on purpose. They couldn't help do it. Merlinus is withered. He's quite pious and humble and all that, but something has been taken out of him. And so this is where you get a sense of Merlin as having tapped into these forces that are real, but that once you come to know them, have to make a choice that they didn't have to make before. Sort of like how when we ask questions of uh, microscopic particles, of subatomic particles. We ask things like, are you here or there? It's only then that they have to be somewhere, because before that, without us observing them, they're not the sorts of things that occur to us, right? We are the ones who experience the world in terms of position and time and, and so forth. Beyond our experience, we can't describe how things are, because it's beyond our experience. And so particles that don't have any inherent uh, necessity of, of living in our experience have to take on a certain form and location in, in our experience. And Merlin now has to decide what this whole science project, <laughs> as it were, is. Is it the attempt to seize control of the world in order to bend it to his will, or it is, is an attempt to discern more and more of the order in the world that has been put there by a higher will. And, and that's what Merlin is about, and that's the question that he faces. And to conclude, I just want to read one passage that is all about really what has been the theme of this episode, which is the idea that the order we experience in the world is... It's good for us to do that, but it becomes evil the minute we decide that our 
perceptions and our experience and what we can understand is the limit of everything that there is. And then we try to impose that limit on everything else that exists. But the more things we discover that exist, the more we realize that actually the order we're able to impose on our experience is always less extensive than the order of the universe because the order of the universe has a source outside of the universe itself in the place where what looks to us like randomness has a supernatural order. And that's what we get in the book. We, we get this conversation now um, with the, uh, this is a, another character with, uh, her, her name is Grace and you don't need to know that much about her in this context, but you should read the book and find out. Somebody says that uh, the attempt to travel back to space, which is what Ransom is about to do, is contrary to the observed laws of nature. The director smiled without speaking as a man who refuses to be drawn. It is not contrary to the laws of nature, said a voice from the corner where Grace Ironwood sat, almost invisible in the shadows. You are quite right. The laws of the universe are never broken. Your mistake is to think that the little regularities we have observed on one planet for a few hundred years are the real unbreakable laws, whereas they are only the remote results which the true laws bring about more often than not as a kind of accident. That's what I've been saying this whole time. Lewis, of course, says it more clearly than I ever could, right? The, they are only the remote results which the true laws bring about more often than not as a kind of accident. Shakespeare never breaks the real laws of poetry, put in Dimble, but following them, he breaks every now and then the little regularities which critics mistake for the real laws. Then the little critics call it a license, but there's nothing licentious about Shakespeare. It's a perfect analogy, and that is how actual science, as opposed to quote-unquote the science or whatever, that's how actual science proceeds, is through discovery of license that God is taking in, in the poetic sense with the world and realizing that from the font of his sensibilities, more laws and patterns are being generated than just the ones that we have been able to pan out. And it's sort of like saying, you know, we see that waves lap on the shore, right? We, we look at the shore and we see the waves lapping. And then we, if, if, we, if we then took that and we said, and so I can conclude that everywhere there are waves, they make little, you know, white foam. And that is all that they do. That is how they work. But of course, if you travel out into the ocean, you will discover these great rolling currents that do cause those waves, but don't look anything like them. And even deep beneath that in the the far down depths of the ocean, you will find that there are currents and, and motions of water that we have yet even to fathom and creatures moving about and all sorts of stuff that is outside of anything that we have yet conceived. In much the same way as Shakespeare in his heart, in a way that could never be fully described or categorized, has a, a perception, an experience of the world that he then gives form to in meter and in verse and in poetry and he breaks the it's true that he breaks the rules but of course the rules themselves are only outpourings of the same thing that he is outpouring when he breaks them it's like it's, you know the the you can only break the rules rightly from within the system and um, i had a really interesting conversation on twitter the other day when i made some grumpy comment about people using the word impactful and, and people started saying well why why can't you use that word and you know i can give i think a cogent answer to that question but the real reason is that there is a, a logic inherent to english that you have to discern from inside and once you're inside it it is possible to break the rules. I saw a meme the other day that was, you know, English teachers when their students break the rules of grammar and convention and they're stern, angry, I think it was fish from SpongeBob, right? And then English teachers when uh, famous authors break the rules of convention and it was like they were, they had like hearts in their eyes and they were so overwhelmed. But the thing is like, that's actually right. Like, if, if indeed that is how English teachers still act, that's the right way. Because it is possible to break the smaller rules, which are guidelines that we used, that we kind of extrapolate out of the best practice of, of the greats of the language. But you have to break them once you have been 
nursed on the language, as Keats said, like, like your mother's milk. Once you have it in your bones, then you can start to organically come up with innovations that don't break the rules in the deepest sense, the deep rules, but do break the guidelines that we've developed from observing the way things typically tend to go. And that's what we're always doing with science. We're observing the way things typically tend to go in our observation, but beneath and beyond our observation, and in some ultimate and final sense, inaccessible to our observation, there is a deeper logic and a deeper order groaning like the depths of the ocean and producing wave upon wave that finally lands on our shore. So how's that? Stephen, for the answer to a mailbag question. I hope that was edifying. This has been so, so much fun. I think we will talk about Faust next. So if you have any questions about Faust, I want to do one more magician before we move beyond the whole magic thing because there you know, are other things that we should probably talk about. But this has been wonderful. Thank you for joining me. Um, I won't do a mailbag question because this whole episode has in some sense been a mailbag answer. But I will remind you to uh, share, rate, review, subscribe, five stars, sign up. Uh, I will drop links both to the substacks that I run, but also to some of the articles about the new Oppenheim attempt to reconcile gravity and, and uh, quantum physics, which, by the way, you know, since I am not a scientist, I will definitely not be the person to tell you whether or not that's going to work. Like, it's for the scientists to figure it out. I just thought it was really interesting that the, the, the necessary effort that scientists are having to make, as they made also at the dawn of quantum physics and in the sort of development of statistical mechanics for thermodynamics, is like making randomness a fundamental ingredient. Because, of course, the order that of the things that they're observing takes place outside of our observation and therefore is in some sense supernatural. All right, that's enough on that topic for now. I will talk to you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.